today we're uh, extremely fortunate to have uh, Dr. Tom Van Osdall, the uh, fellow who formed the course, uh, who essentially started the course, and I'll let him uh, tell you about the history of it and, and when it was. Uh, he will be with us today and probably, uh, I've been trying to convince him for the rest of the semester, but uh, I think he's, he, he, does, he keeps laughing like that hysterically every time I suggest that, uh, at least for another uh, three to five sessions uh, to give a little bit of background about, well today about the course, but uh, later about the history of science and uh, a little bit on inductive, deductive reasoning, that type of thing. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Van Osdell. Thanks, Dr. Cole. There seems to be a lot of extra activity here. <clears throat> I never had all this before. It, do you have, can you hear me? I, my voice is not too strong today. Anyone who can't hear, if you will, you could just come forward. Uh, Dr. Cole asked me to briefly talk a little bit about how the course started. And with your permission, I'll just, I'll ramble because, uh, Jerry, I was thinking last night, from the time the course was started, I think, uh, see, it's been three years, I think, since I offered it. I offered it some 45 times. And we started back in 1962 to offer the course. Now let me give you a little of the background on it. <clears throat> I came, I came, well I've been in and out of Ashland, I guess the fourth time in 1957 when I came back. I'd been, I went here as a student, then left to bang around with some dance bands for a while and then decided that uh, that was a killer. Uh, that was in the days of the big bands. And uh, so I always thought maybe that's what I should do, uh, stay in the big band era, but that began to die out after uh, the middle 1940s. And, but in the meantime, I would primarily majored in philosophy and science and chemistry. So prior to coming here the last time, that's way back, uh, I came in 1957 for the fourth time back to Ashland. And for about 10 years before that, I'd been teaching in California. And the last two years that I was in California, all hell seemed to break loose on the college campuses. It started in Berkeley with the Berkeley riots. Uh, it was a total student rebellion. And uh, Jerry, re as I think about that, it um, reminds me much of the early days back in the 15th, 16th century when the students would rebel at Oxford, Cambridge, the Sorbonne, uh, and they would take over the universities. Well, you could sense when this started to happen in about 19, 1950, 54, you had a feeling of it. Didn't break until about 1958, I think, something like that. Uh, the students literally took over. And when I came here in 57, uh, it didn't reach too much into the Midwest for quite a long time. I think about 1960, something like that. With this, the, the really rough 60s, uh, so far as teaching were concerned. And um, the students had decided that they would take over and dictate who was going to teach, how long you could teach, what they wanted to hear, and many of the colleges and universities gave in to it. Uh, there were a great many colleges and universities closed up because they couldn't handle the situation. A classic, a classic example in Ohio was down at Antioch College in Yellow Springs. Uh, the students became so powerful on the campus that if, say, halfway through a semester, they became dis disenchanted or unhappy with the faculty member, they would go to the Board of Trustees and get the faculty member fired. And it literally ruined uh, Antioch College. They're slowly coming back. But, um, but most of the colleges, particularly in the Midwest, hung on and tried to give to a certain, we had students, I noticed this when I came back in 57, that by 1960, um, we were giving in a great deal. In other words, that what the student was saying 
you can't tell us what we have to study. I'm going to be uh, a businessman, therefore I want to take all business courses. I want to be a, a research chemist, therefore I have no need for history, philosophy, uh, religion, anything else. I just want to take the courses I want to take. Well, fortunately, most of the liberal arts colleges, so-called, did hang in there and were able to have the students take a sufficient variety of courses that gave what we thought were some, would be some semblance of a liberal education. It was a tough time. And I'm surprised in many cases that even more colleges didn't uh, go by the boards. Well, at about that time, in 1959, this, this is where the course really got started. Uh, over in England, uh, Sir Charles Snow, who had been one of the world's great physicists and directed the science program during World War II. And Snow did the unforgivable thing. Uh, he was a profoundly competent scientist, but he always wanted to be a writer. And in 1959, he wrote a, he wrote a little essay which he read, um, it was called the Reed Lecture, and he read it at Cambridge University in England. And I just want to read one paragraph, because this is what got me started. In that lecture, and th this book is in the library, you can check it out, it's called The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution. Snow makes this statement. He says, it is something like this. In our society, we have lost even the presence of a common culture. Persons educated with the greatest intensity we know can no longer communicate with each other on the plane of their major intellectual concern. This is serious for our creative, intellectual, and above all, our normal life. It is leading us to interpret the past wrongly, <clears throat> to misjudge the present, and to deny our hopes of the future. It is making it difficult or impossible for us to get a good education. Now, when Snow, and then he goes on to talk about all aspects of what he calls the two cultures. At the time, at the time that Snow gave this, he, he argued that there were two basic cultures, a culture of science and a culture of the humanities. He could have said any number of cultures. In fact, to be a little bit facetious, there are, there are many cultures. Uh, I've even heard it said that there are groups of people who live in a culture of Beatlemania, that their whole life is concentrated in that direction. But, but at this time, uh, beginning here on the college, now it, it wasn't felt as strongly in, in the United States, but we did have this happen as a result of the Berkeley Revolution people began, students began to withdraw from what they call the mainstream of life. They were, they became what you might call people of a counterculture. We had the hippies, the yippies, the zippies. We hadn't gotten into the yuppies and so on at that point, but the hippies, that was the big one. And so they, they began to set up little communes. They said, we're not going to let you as a college a university tell us what we want to do, we'll just withdraw. We'll set up communes and study what we want. It was very interesting because I met a number of students. There were some, a few on this campus who withdrew from uh, Ashton College and joined the hippie movements in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and so on. And I, I would question them about it. They, and the, the point that they would make, we have no obligation to our parents our parents owe us everything, but we don't owe them anything. And I, I never could quite understand that. We would argue this pro and con, but they did. And many of them withdrew. And finally, uh, they said, we will, we will do nothing which smacks of serving the, the culture of our present uh, society. So actually, they began to adhere to a counterculture, but that has all stopped. I, I don't think there are any of those communes, with, with few exceptions. They've all, all come back in within the framework of the culture of today. But Snow was aware of this. Now, Snow also said in this lecture on the two cultures, he said there's one place, there's one place where there is not this total separation 
this polarization, and it's in the United States. And Snow always argued that if you're going to be well-educated, you ought to have more than just one discipline. You ought to do a few things. Now, now England was a classic example because they are totally specialized. In fact, I started, as I say, Dr. Coe, I started this course in 64, and about two years later, I had, I had begun to write letters to C.P. Snow about this Reed lecture. And he became, there was a new university started in England called Sussex University, uh, down near Brighton, England. So he was a, uh, C.P. Snow was a trustee at this college or university. So he contacted, he said, would you, why don't you bring your course over to England and teach it over here for a semester? Because he said, we are starting a new university and it's going to be different from Cambridge and Oxford, University of London in this respect, that every student who graduates from Sussex sometime during the pursuit of their baccalaureate degree will have to take one so-called quote unquote interdisciplinary course. And he said, I'd like to see what you have. So I went over for a semester and I, I had my eyes really opened because I could see the tremendous difference between our education system here and in England. For example, the students at Sussex, now they were, they were required to take this one interdisciplinary course. If you were going to be a chemist, you took chemistry, physics, and math, and one course in biology, and you got your baccalaureate degree. If you were going to be a, a literary person, you, you studied uh, literature, writing, prose, poetry, but you didn't have any science whatsoever. And it really had polarized, and Snow said, we've got to break down this barrier. Well, we've done a better job of it here, in America than they've done in England. England still tends to resist, even at Cambridge and Oxford today. You do not have to take any course outside of your major field. You, you are told, stay in the field of science, stay in the field of religion, stay in the field of the humanities or the literary uh, disciplines and so on. Well, I, I felt that maybe, maybe even though we are an a liberal arts college, there ought to be a course that would be interdisciplinary. Well, coming here in 1957, have any, did any of you ever have Dr. Snyder as a teacher? Yeah, so, okay. Um, interestingly enough, about the first week that I was here, I met Snyder. Now, Snyder was head of the English department, and he always looked down his nose, if you will, at science. He didn't, he hadn't had much work in science. I always, I always accused Snyder. We became the best of friends. And people would often, when they'd hear us talking, they'd say, you say you're a friend of Snyder's? Yes, how can you talk that way? Or how would he talk to you this way? I, I would say to Snyder, you look down on science in arrogance, primarily to hide your ignorance. And he would toss, and, and so we'd, we'd carry this back and forth. Now Snow argued this. Snow says, how can you be educated if you don't know a little bit about thermodynamics? And likewise, how can you be educated if you don't know a little Shakespeare to just pick something out of the head? This is true in, in England. In fact, there are students, I met students at Sussex who even though they were born and raised in England, really didn't know what Shakespeare was all about. They'd never read any Shakespeare, but they could tell you all about the laws of thermodynamics and so on. Well, this, this was very common, and it had begun to take hold here. And so I, pres I, went, I, I developed a syllabus for a course like this that I wanted to teach, and I took it to the curriculum committee in 1964. And the first time I presented it, they turned it down. <laughs> they said, we don't want something like this. And so I rewrote it, went back, and I, I presented it two or three times before they would accept it. But then, you know, what was wrong was this. I, I said this, I want to be a course, and I say it right now, 
and I hope the fellows who take this over, they can do as they will, but I hope they would do this, that have you folks understand that this is not a course in science. It's not a course in philosophy, if you will, of science, but it is about science. What is science? Because science is a very misunderstood thing. Uh, most, most of us really don't know the difference between science and technology. I can remember <clears throat> Snyder and uh, some of the colleagues over in the humanities would begin to tear down everything that's bad you scientists have done. Everything. It's all your fault. Well, I'd say, well, <clears throat> there are some bad things. And there's been some pretty bad prose and some pretty bad... Uh, um, literature in general written and there have been some mighty poor pictures painted and some some lousy music written but of course they would say well that doesn't uh, that doesn't affect the individual you fellows have developed nuclear energy you've, you've hung a nuclear bomb over our head uh, everything that's bad is, sci is the fault of science well then I would say why do you use it uh, I, I've often said this to Snyder if you have a headache which you complain about having very, very frequently, why do you take an aspirin tablet? Why don't you write a poem to cure it? Uh, if, if nuclear energy is so bad and you develop cancer, why do you allow them to treat you with radioactive cobalt or whatever they're going to use? Why don't you write a poem and cure your cancer? And not saying that, that the therapy of x-rays, radiation, whatnot will do it, but it probably stands a chance. Now, I'll admit, a good Christian scientist would say, well, I don't go to the doctor. I, do, I use the, the power of the mind. But so we went round and round. And <clears throat> uh, in general, the attempt that I was wanting to put forth was to try to show that, uh, well, in the words of Jacques Berzun in the House of Intellect, Berzun argues this, you don't have to be a profoundly disciplined person in every one of the part aspects of our culture, but it would be nice if we could understand a little bit about it. If we could have read a little bit of Shakespeare or Dostoevsky or, or um, Thomas Mann or a little bit of Ernest Hemingway, if we would have gone into a, a museum and could see some of, of Rembrandt's work or Botticelli or Jackson Pollock for a modern anything, or if we could hear some good music, if you'd, we had at least been introduced to some of the, I'll say some Beethoven, some good, some good solid jazz music, and understood what Louis Armstrong and Dave Brubeck and these people are trying to do, it would make life a little more interesting. And in like manner, if we could appreciate what the scientist is trying to do, we would get along better. Well, you know. C.P. Snow did the unforgivable. He served as probably England's greatest scientist during World War II. Then when the war was over, he said, I always wanted to be a writer. And he turned to writing novels, which were very successful. Now this was tough on Snow because those people in the science culture wouldn't forgive him. They said, you've prostituted science, you've walked away from it to become a novelist. And he was so successful in writing novels that the people over in the literary furies were mad because they said, how come a person who's a stupid scientist can come over here and write a novel that is accepted? And you know, the same thing happened here. When I, turned, when I began to develop this course, my colleagues in the science area said, oh, you're selling out to the humanities. I said, no, I'm not selling out. I'm only trying to bring them together a little bit. The people over in the humanities said, we don't want you. You've not been trained thoroughly in the, in the humanities, so why are you coming over here? And my plea in both cases was I'm not trying to do anything to either one. I'm merely trying to say, let's try to appreciate a little bit of what each is trying to do. I should be, look, if this course is to be successful, it has to have your participation. You have to be willing to express your ideas. And my point with you folks and to the people who would handle this is that there is no such thing as a foolish question 
if it's well intended. There is no such thing as a question which shouldn't be asked if it bothers you. And it should be a question in many cases that can be addressed to the, all of the class and to the people involved. And, and we'll have all cross sections. I remember one case in particular. I can still see two fellows right here in this, these two chairs. A, a fellow who had come over <clears throat> from Freiburg, Germany. He wanted to take a year over here. In some way, he had come to Ashton College. I also had a young fellow who was plan he would graduate this, that year and planned to enter the seminary here on the Ashton College campus. Well, Carl, who was the German, had one basic philosopher that he worshipped, and that was Nietzsche. And Carl was, I found out in the course of this semester's work, he was a very, very confirmed atheist. And he made no bones about it. But it came out all at once, because one day I had posed a question about God. Well, first of all, in the, in the 60s, I didn't dare ask that question in a class like this. If I began to talk about God, I would invariably have some students raise their hands and say, I thought that uh, this was a course about science. How can you put God in science? Well, my answer had to be, what, what, if we truly know what science is all about, you wouldn't ask that kind of a question, and then you try to explain the whole situation. Well, to get back to this point, this fellow who, one day I posed a question like that, and the fellow from Germany said, well, that's a foolish question. I said, why? Well, he said, because there is no God. That's just an anthropomorphic thing. That's just something that, uh, that uh, Jean-Paul Sartre would say it's an existentialistic thing when you try to conjure up a god, and he went into it, and the fellow sitting beside jumped up and started shaking his fist, and he said, well, you can't, you can't say that. There is a god. And they started a really great argument, and I backed off and let him go just to see what would happen. <laughs> it, it, it was a good argument because, look, what I'm getting at here is this. In the course of developing this program, we have to ask the question, what is science? Now, first of all, you folks, some of your, what, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and so on, you, get to, you begin to fall in love with your particular discipline. And I would say this at the very start, that if you would make science your God, then you can't have God in your science. You're worshiping the wrong thing. If you would make religion your God, you won't have God in your religion. You'll fall victim to uh, some of the, well, I won't mention names, uh, some of the fundamentalists that roam around, and so we turn on the television, and we see that some of them have put God in some rather precarious positions, if you will. Uh, the, the whole point being that we have to understand what the thing is all about. Now, I would argue this, that science now, I'm talking about science, and if I uh, come back a few times, I'll, I'll harbor, harp more and more on this. Science really can address two questions. It can address the question of how. How do you explain something? Uh, what technique would you use to explain it? You can ask what. What is, what is the reason? What makes this do, act as it does? But science cannot address the question of why. If you say, why is the earth? Why was I born? Think of Paul Robeson singing Old Man River. Uh, why was I born? Why is there such a thing as gravity? Why, does this, why is there sunlight? Uh, that's something, why is there gravity and inertia and so on? These are things that we take for granted. Anaximander, which we'll talk about next week, Anaximander would say, because they are. There are some things that science can't answer. When you ask the question, why, you are directing your thoughts to primarily to theology or to philosophy. Those are philosophical questions. But as Dr. Cole would say, if you would say, what makes a reaction take place? Well, we'll conjure up a concept of an atom we'll have electrons and protons, and we'll talk about atomic reactivity and so on. We can offer some tools that help us to explain certain things. But if you say, why, why is there such a thing as an atom? We don't know. 
Why was it born? Why was it created? Uh, when Sir Isaac Newton was living, he became the truly great scientist of all, one of the great of all time. And he became so profoundly influential that some wag wrote a little poem like this, in the beginning was God. And God said, let there be Newton, and then there was light. So it's, it's one of these things that becomes very philosophical. No, there, there are certain things then that we cannot answer. We struggle for answers. Science, let me put it this way. Science is really an adventure in wonder and hope. You wonder what makes things happen. You adventure through this life process of doing what we call experimentation to try to answer some questions, and you hope that you'll come up with some answers. Science is not technology. Now, technology makes use of science, and science makes use of technology, to be sure. But they are uh, pretty much separate things. So in order to get started, I've always felt this, and I've just rambled around here. To get started, I think that it's worthwhile <clears throat> to go back as far back as we can to the very beginning. So I've always done this. I've gone back as far as Stonehenge because there's a lot we can learn from Stonehenge on the Salisbury Plain in England. Many uh, theories about Stonehenge, but I think we know some pretty profoundly accurate uh, problems to be answered by Stonehenge. Then I think we need to take a look at the ancient uh, lives of Egypt, the building of the Great Pyramids, and the tremendous things that we've learned from those, because they are both scientific and technological. Then I think for us in the Western culture, we have to then take a good hard look. Now, not a deep in-depth look as uh, Dr. Chesmar would do in his, in his philosophy classes, but I think we ought to look at the influence of Thales, of Anaximander, of Parmenides, of uh, Plato, of Aristotle, of Pythagoras, of Heraclitus, of Zeno, of Archimedes, who was probably the one experimenter in ancient Greek culture, because the Greeks really laid the groundwork for modern science. And, and I think I could show that from the standpoint of the purest in science, the Greeks were the really honest-to-goodness scientists, because they never tried. They never tried to apply what they had learned. Now, you might say, well, that's silly. If you, if you come up with some idea in science, why shouldn't you make use of it? Now, when we get into, then I would go, after having considered those, I would then jump to the Renaissance. And certainly we would look <clears throat> at the early work of Galileo, of Kepler, of Newton. Then the two great dominant minds in the Renaissance, uh, well, I would also have to include Leonardo. But then uh, Sir Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, because Rene Descartes laid down a, a philosophy of science, which in a sense was deductive, Neoplatonic. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon laid down a philosophy of science which was inductive in character, uh, and and an a posteriori thing, gather a whole bunch of facts and induce a conclusion. Whereas Neoplatonism and Descartes would say, no, it's an a priori thing. We have a leap of imagination. I'd, and I'd like, I would want to go into that pretty carefully because there's the whole essence of, of science in, in that very, in the minds of those two people. And I don't think you can separate them. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we, we need to understand the historical development. And I think it should be done. Now, there are countless names that I've left out. But it should be done, I think, in terms of this Greek thought, the influence of the Egyptians, and just for sake of interest, what was done at Stonehenge, and then get into this Renaissance period of Leonardo, 
Galileo, <coughs> Kepler, Bacon, and, and Descartes. Then you can jump to modern science. There was a lot that happened in between. But nevertheless, those were the, those were the great names, uh, primarily, that uh, led to this development. Now, there are, there are, there are limitations. <coughs> in other words, when we're talking about science, science can't answer everything. There is a limit beyond which it cannot go. And we have to come to recognize this. Now, many of the things have been good. A lot of people would, on the other hand, blame science. For example, right now, and, and here's where I'm sure Dr. Cole and Dr. Chis, uh, Chismar will want to introduce other things, because it, here, it's been three years since this course was offered. And I've always tried to make the course a very open-ended thing because so much happens in the course of a year that needs to be discussed. Now, in the, inter in the three years since I had this course, think of what has happened in the promotion of all types of commuter science, uh, uh, in all types of uh, work on space travel, good or bad. Is it good? Some of you say we shouldn't be doing it. Some of you would say it's a great thing. Uh, we have to answer it. We try to at least address the questions. <clears throat> then there are those who still resort to the nuclear bomb. And right now, uh, we're talking about a, <clears throat> a new uh, meeting between uh, the Russians and, the, and, the, and America on the problem of control of, of um, nuclear warheads and so on. And we have the, the protesters carrying banners, protesting. I've argued this way. We have the nuclear bomb, whether it was right or wrong. I, Einstein said he, he was sorry that he ever, had he known what was going to happen when he developed the relativity theory, which opened the doorway for the atomic bomb and nuclear energy, he says, I, if I had known what was going to be done with that, I would have been either a musician or a plumber. I would have dropped out of science. Um, this is what uh, Leonardo, Leonardo came up with a lot of workable ideas, but he never, he never tried them. Well, so we have people that are protesting nuclear bombs. My, my argument uh, right now is this. I'm not denying, I'm not denying that we might not all go down the drain from a, a nuclear war. God only knows it could happen in an instant. But I have the feeling that if we are to be sucked down the drain at all, it'll be because of drugs and AIDS. I think those are far more serious than a nuclear warhead. And maybe it'll take both of them, I don't know. And maybe we'll solve them both. I'm, I'm, an, I'm the eternal optimist. I think that any of these problems can and will be solved. But they are serious problems that we do have to consider. Now we need to talk about those things. Some of those things you can lay in the lap of science but not all of them. Some of the things have been for great good. And in fact, how I put it, let me put it this way. Um, an automobile can be an ambulance of mercy. It can also be a gangster's getaway car. It depends on how we use it. There's some good and some bad, if you will, in almost everything that we do. We can't avoid it. Now, we can show that Sir Francis Bacon, in developing his philosophy of science, he argued that everything, everything that we do to collect facts is fine. But he, he was the first one to say it this way, what good is it to collect these facts if we're not going to use them? If they're not useful, throw them out. Well, I think that's wrong, because uh, science, couldn't re science couldn't advance if we had to have something absolutely useful for every fact that's gathered. In fact, facts per se are useless, and yet they are the finest things in the world. But I'll put it this way. One of the most tragic things that can happen is to have a beautiful scientific theory totally destroyed, and it's happened over and over again when someone comes up with an ugly fact that destroys that theory, and we have to start all over again. But this has been the progress of science. Uh, it, it, it's a meaningful thing, and it's a rewarding thing if we know what we're doing. But the great bulk of people don't understand it. 
They don't understand what science is all about. Now, to do this, here's the way I think is a nice way that I've found. In the course of developing the semester, I think we need to took, take a good look at a number of things. Can, can we look at, and I know you have different interests, different majors, we ought to take a look at science and music. How are they related? Science and religion, goodness only knows there's a, a, one of the very profoundly important things. Can a, scient, can a scientist be religious? Can a theologian accept science? The answer is yes, if we understand what it's all about. I have had more tragic arguments with fundamentalist people in religion who don't even want me to use the word evolution. It's an instrument of the devil. And you try to show them that everything changes. That's all we're talking about. It's a change, a changing process. And even we as human beings have evolved. Whether we want the creationist theory or the evolution theory, it makes no difference. One's is as important as the other. It depends on how we're using it and where we're using it. We ought to look at science and religion. We ought to look at science and medicine because medicine owes a great debt to science and we in science owe a great debt to medicine. We ought to look at science and law. What's the difference? What's the difference between a scientific law and if there are such things and uh, a legalistic law? Well, how do they differ? Now, quite often during the course of the semester, I've had people come in as guest talk, guest lecturers. Maybe have a lawyer, a theologian, uh, a musician, an economist, because science and economics are very closely allied. And I think if we can do this, and then, then above all, have you folks interject your ideas. In other words, there should never be a time when you're afraid to, to ask questions and to disagree with what is being said. And in fact, it, it's a good idea to use, I've always done this, I've always tried to play the devil's advocate, if only to get some of you aroused and angry because that's the only way you're going to get anything done. Because if you, if you tend to sit back and are totally complacent on what's going on, then we don't accomplish the thing we want. And no, no amount of disagreement. I would want you folks to feel this, uh, at least for me. Now, you may have trouble with the other two fellows, but I would think you ought to feel perfectly free to disagree and have the absolute assurance that it's in no way going to affect your grade. Uh, you you can you can say well a certain amount of deference uh, uh, with what you say, but you should be willing to express how you feel. And I, as a person who might be up in front, should be perfectly willing to have you say it. And I should listen to you as much as you listen to me. And at no time should you be afraid to interrupt. Now, if it's a guest speaker, sometimes you should wait perhaps till the session is over. That's beside the point. Those things can work out. But the success of the program depends on your cooperation, your willingness to do it. Uh, then, um, in, the, in terms of the historical standpoint, I think we can show best as we go through the semester's work how all of this plays back to the historical background. <clears throat> this, in 1987, relates to what was done by Sir Isaac Newton, by Einstein, even clear back to the uh, work of Democritus and so on. Uh, we are, uh, there is no such thing, folks, there is no such thing as a discontinuous situation. Uh, some, someone, I, I don't know who, who this was, I, I've forgotten. But once, one time, uh, one of the lecturers in the history of science was, ma was giving a lecture and some one of the students said, isn't it wonderful that we know so much more today than those poor people who lived 100, 200, 500 years ago? And the answer that the, the lecturer gave was, yes, it is wonderful. We know them. We know them. 
In other words, we couldn't be doing what we're doing today had it not been for the work of, of those who had gone before. It, uh, Sir, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Isaac Newton said at the end of his life, if I have contributed anything at all to this thing called science and philosophy, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. I've had them go before me and pave the way. And Einstein said the same thing. And Einstein always made this statement. He, he, he backed up a little bit. But he always said, Raffiniertist der Herrgott, aber Goschaft er ist nicht. God will be subtle, but he will never be malicious. And his great friend Niels Bohr, who constantly quarreled with him. Bohr was the founder of our modern quantum theory. And he disagreed with Einstein a great deal. And toward the end of Einstein's life, Bohr said, my friend, would you still say God is subtle, but he will never be malicious? And Einstein thought, for, well, he said, maybe just a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. So we move forward in history and it's a continuous thing. 1987 rests on 86, 85, 1775, and on back and on back in 1456 and so on. And what we know today is an accumulation of that knowledge, and then we hope that we can jump forward and move forward. Now what we want to try to do is to try to appreciate, try to come to appreciate the importance of this and how it relates. I'll put it this way. Science is important, but it's absolutely no more important than work in religion, a great Shakespearean play, a Beethoven symphony, a, a Brubeck record, whatever it is, it, 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 it is important. But Louis Armstrong was every bit as important in his contribution to the social complex as was Niels Bohr. It, it all goes to make up this thing which we call our culture. Now, can we exist? I don't know whether we've done anything at all <clears throat> to fuse the cultures together. Maybe it's, uh, Dr. Cole and I were talking not too long ago, maybe we've polarized even more, it's hard to say. But we don't dare let that deter us. We have to continue talking about it because only by doing that can we hope to see some continuity, some worthwhileness in this whole thing. Now, on Monday, you know, the class meets, then I think we ought to start with Stonehenge and with the Great Pyramid and get into the Greek philosophy. That, 